Hey, it is the Bet Las Vegas, and a Thursday that suddenly became super busy. Of course, Golden Knights in the playoffs. Uh, apparently, we're getting a baseball team quicker than we thought. We'll have more news on that. We got the Javante Davis fight and the NBA playoffs, which leads me to my guest because Mo Moten is joining us, and we're going to get into some basketball first before we really get into the other thing that's happening. We are a week away from the NFL draft. Of course, last year we hosted. This year we are a full participant. The Raiders looking to make a huge impact. 12 total picks this year. Samomo so joins us, of course, from Bleacher Report, Sports Not, and the Odyssey Original Podcast, a Silver and Black Today. Mo, how are you? I was going to wear my Patrick Ewing jersey today, but I decided <laughs> to go with the Oakland Athletics hat. My friend, what do you make of this Knicks and Cavaliers series? Uh, <laughs> many people know if they're watching this know I'm a, I'm a Knicks fan, grew up a Knicks fan, born and raised. I have a feeling, I have a feeling <sighs> Adrian might be part of the enemy, but I said it. You've been the wearing playoffs. that Brooklyn Nets hat the entire year. That is a Brooklyn Nets hat. I don't care if it doesn't say the Nets, my G. <laughs> Brooklyn. I, I ripped off the Nets emblem. And I'm just repping my borough. That's how much of a Knicks fan I am. I would disrespect the Brooklyn Nets hat just to rep my borough, and that's how it goes. Knicks in seven. I said it before the playoffs started. I'm sticking with it. The Knicks stole one with a physical performance. Of course, the Cavs came back and even the series. That's fine. Julius Randle gets hurt because Tibbs is an idiot and has him late in the game when um, I don't want to say meaningless minutes. I understand Randle wanted to get into his rhythm, but you got to protect your players. But still... Jalen Brunson, R.J. Barrett will finally find himself Knicks in seven, beating the Cavaliers in Cleveland. Let me just say one thing. Julius Randle, you should be embarrassed. You should not be allowed to dunk a ball when you're down by 20. You get to lay that thing up, all right, my guy? Anytime you shoot, it's disgusting. You're like a fake-ass Zach Randolph. Oh, R.J. Man. Barrett is going to be playing overseas Get up on your Chinese, my guy, RJ. Uh, who else? Who else? Who is Quentin Grimes? Obi Toppin. Look. Manual quickly. Steph is going to step up. You know. They could barely Toppin. score 40 points last in game two at halftime. It's 1980s basketball. It is truly disgusting. Cavs in five. From there. What? And, and, and if you're from New York watching this, if you're from New York watching this, look at this. I'm in my home, and I'm able to do this, move around comfortably. <laughs> it's a really nice feeling. And my rent didn't cost $3,500. Let's go, Cavs in five. From that, we move on to the Raiders. Uh, thank you, Mo. I appreciate you, by the way. Um, let's move on to the Raiders. And before we get to the draft, because the draft is almost here, that means that the free agency period, not finished, um, but some of the major moves, of course, have already been, you know, laid laid down, and then they've done what they've done. And I say major moves, and, you know, there really wasn't that this offseason. Of course, we traded Darren Waller, but we go from a first year for this new regime, giving out contract extensions, trading for huge superstars, to this year kind of um, a completely different mentality. Um, with everything that's happened this uh, offseason, getting Jimmy G, I forgot to mention that, of course, um, what do you make of just the offseason that the Raiders have had? It's definitely a rebuild type offseason. And I, and I've Raider fans have asked me this a lot. Is it a rebuild? Is it not? And I think it's because people associate rebuild with new GM, new head coach, and then you turn over the roster. And what happened was Dave Ziegler and Josh Fields came in and they tried to win. And I say that because you, you don't do that if you're if you're gonna get Devonta Adams and sign to extension. You, as you mentioned, you give Waller an extension, you give Hunter Renfro an extension. You bring in Chandler Jones. Those are win down moves, and it didn't work out. They go six and eleven, so they have to pivot, and change of course of plans. And you said it: not a lot of spice in this free agency, other than Jimmy Garoppolo. And Jimmy Garoppolo's contract is modest relative to the quarterback market. So a lot of short deals, a lot of guys who are going to be backups and rotational players. What the Raiders are doing is saying, "Look, we're going to put all our eggs into the draft, and we're going to build through the draft," which is what a lot of teams do in a rebuild. They have veterans who know the system. A lot of Raider fans gripe because a lot of former Patriots are now on the roster. But those guys are going to challenge the rookies coming in. And it's going to be a battle between Patriots, former 
Patriots veterans and rookies and may the best man win. And that's what you want at training camp. You want good competition. And, you know, to stay in that vein about this team and, and kind of, um, you know, where they're headed, you know, obviously this draft is very important. I said at the top, they'll have at least 12 total picks, depending on what happens during the draft, if they make any moves. Um, It's also, it's the last draft for players that if they transferred, they'd have to wait out a year with the old rules. Also, a lot of the dudes that took advantage of the COVID rules. Um, oh, yeah. Separate of that, Raiders fans know how how much a bad draft can impact the future of the team. Shout out to Mike Mayock and John Gruden. <laughs> um, and before we actually get into the draft and the philosophy, I also kind of laid out what this new regime with Ziegler and McDaniels has done so far. What is this, 15, 16 months into their tenure, which first year – was trading for players, getting extensions, going all in. This year, seems like they're building through the draft. So complete, what is it, 180s? Or, yeah, 180. 180. Um, yeah, a complete 180 from the philosophy. So I guess my question to you is, and sorry for being long-winded, is what do you make of this regime and what do you truly feel they're going to be? Is it going to be a combination of both? TBD. Uh, it's 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 a wait-and-see approach simply because – I. Look, I'll be the first to say I don't have a lot of faith in Josh McDaniels, right? Uh, not a good track record, obviously. Never that was a while ago, but something was brought up to my attention. I was on one of these shows, and I and, and it was saying that the Raiders are now run the way they're run. It's you could see the mistakes that Josh McDaniels made in the previous in the past because some of the turnover that they had, people will say it was unnecessary. Now I know we don't talk long snappers a lot, but they got rid of their long snapper Trent C and brought in another guy that their special teams coordinator is familiar with uh, McMahon. So what my point is, when you jettison players, you trade down Waller, you trade your long snapper, you get rid of some guys for some system fits, that could rub some guys in the locker room the wrong way. Now, as far as the direction of the team, again, I said this is going to be a team where it's going to be veterans versus rookies. It's going to be a rebuild year. I, I can't say where they're going to land. Are they going to be a six-win team? Are they going to be a nine-win team? But it's definitely built for the future. And if you listen to Mark Davis, if you listen to the owner Mark Davis, Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziggler are going to at least get two more years. I know Raider fans are not going to want to hear that, but they're going to get at least two more years to build this team because if you're building through the draft, you're hoping that those players pop within three years. Now, Josh McDaniels, as I said, Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziggler already had one. So I think they get two more to develop their draft prospects and hopefully make something of this uh, 2023 class. And, I mean, you were kind of nice on McDaniels there in terms of just bringing up the long snapper, but you look at getting rid of the quarterback, the, the long-time quarterback. quarterback, of course, Jay mm -hmm. Cutler um, and, and Carr. You look at Darren Waller, you can make mm -hmm. the comparison to getting rid of Brandon Marshall. Marshall. Um, if he drafts Anthony Richardson, is it a Tebow comparison? I don't want to disrespect Anthony like that because I think Tim Tebow is awful. Oh, yeah. But I'm just yeah. saying, some of the things are there. Um, and before – Actually, let, let's talk about Josh Jacobs because then we can fully get into the draft. Um, obviously, my man has been playing the villain uh, and quoting the Joker and many other villains on his IG story. He's been very transparent, as he always is, about the mm. future, about how yeah. he needs to get his. It needs to make sense. He wants to be a part of this team, but he ain't going to do it for chump change, and rightfully so. Um, but the running back market has been weird, right? You got Saquon Barkley, who's a free agent. He isn't getting the money that you would assume from from his future, his past. You got Derrick Henry with trade rumors. Um, hell, there's even talk about getting rid of Nick Chubb in Cleveland because it's going to be a very pass heavy offense with Deshaun Watson, um, Dalvin Cook, and, and and there's others that are still out there on the market and the free agency for running backs are kind of getting the shaft. Um, mm -hmm. With Josh Jacobs ha ha not signing the franchise tag yet, how do you see this playing out? I think he's actually going to have to play out the year on the tag. And it kind of concerns me because I think he – I don't want to say he'll be a distraction, but during Super Bowl week, I don't know if you caught this, but he said he's willing to to play under the franchise tag if the Raiders build around him, if they build a solid roster. But he said, if you're going to – if you want me to be the hero, you got to pay me to be the hero, meaning if I'm one of the top players on this roster on a rebuilding roster that's not going to compete for a playoff spot, then you're going to have to pay me. So – there's a lot hinging on this draft class because if Jacobs arrives at training camp and he looks around at this roster and he says, this is a five-win team. You're going to have to pay me to play for this five-win team, to carry this five-win team. And and I and I get it from a 
from a business perspective. A lot of people like to look at it from the team perspective, but from the player at a position where there's a lot of turnover, you know, within three years, you can go from a, a rushing champion to being on the scrap heap of free agency. And as you said, the running back market is in the toilet right now. So I understand he wants to get paid, but the way things are going, running backs just aren't getting the bag this offseason. So I think Josh Jacobs is going to wind up playing for $10.1 million. Now, that's not a bad sum, but of course, he wants that long-term security. Momo and joining us here from Bleacher Report Sports 9, and of course, the Odyssey original podcast, Silver and Black Today. And then let's dive into the draft. And I first want to start out with you brought up Josh Jacobs and how he might be uh, a problem child for this team um, this season if, if he's upset about his contract status. Um, we were lucky enough to talk to Michael Lombardi a few weeks ago, of course, father of a person, a part of the coaching staff, and he made waves on his show talking about Darren Waller after he was traded. And obviously when a team gets rid of a player, that's when we start hearing all these things about they were a problem child and drama and not showing up to this and not wanting to do that and going into the draft that can you know seamlessly transition into C.J. Stroud and some of the weird-ass things that are happening right now and him not being a part of a camp or he has an attitude problem. None of this was ever heard at Ohio State, by the way. I promise you I know. So I guess from a big-picture standpoint, what do you make – about these character comments, because you brought it up a little bit earlier, um, getting rid of the long snapper and getting rid of this, that, and the third. Um, I think Las Vegas fans, when they come to the Golden Knights a few years ago, kind of went through this where people, where the team was getting rid of fan favorite players, and not only just from the fans' point of view, but in the locker room, these glue guys that held the locker room together and were leaders and people don't think about that when they're playing Madden and they're playing GM and we're all doing the mock drafts about the actual personalities and you have to have leaders and you have to have people that hold people accountable and that have been there a long time and know what this what what this team means to the city, this, that, and the third. So I just – I find it curious from a big-picture standpoint, what do you make about this attitude? Because it happens a lot with players where they just make comments and when they're done, they just – they try to paint the wrong picture – uh, when it comes to front office guys and some of the rumors that come out. I will say for one, I, I honestly don't think Josh Jacobs is going to cause a stir. I, I think he'll quietly go to the front office and, and ask for a new deal. And if, if they can't work out a new deal, he'll, he'll request a trade. And I'm sure they'll be able to move him coming off again, leading the league in Russia with over 1600 yards. He'll have some suitors, but to your, to your question, I think it's just a matter of, I see a lot of players pushing back on some of the narratives out there on social media. You mentioned C.J. Stroud, and I think that's important because at this time of year, you hear it all the time. There's always that top five player that has character issues. He didn't show up to some football camp. He didn't go to some kid's birthday party he promised to go to. You know, something happened in eighth grade where he punched a guy, in, a kid in the eye or something like that. It's it's so weird that it this pops up a week before the draft, but a point was made on Twitter. I think I think it was Matt Miller. His fan said this. He said, you have to think about why these comments are coming out now, especially with CJ Stroud. He's been beat up in the media over the past few weeks. There was something uh, coming out that he's not exactly the easiest to coach. Now there's coming about this Manning camp, you know. So I, I think that these are teams that QB needy teams may be leaking certain things or just putting certain things out there so that CJ Stroud falls because we're hearing that Bryce Young is probably going to go to the Panthers. And that the Texans aren't in love with any other quarterback other than Bryce Young. So if a team wants to move up to number two, they're probably hoping that C.J. Stroud drops and the Texans don't take him. So there's some gamesmanship going on there. But I like the fact that I like seeing Ryan Clark and Jalen Ramsey kind of stick up for C.J. Stroud and saying, look, this is BS. Why are we bringing this up right now? And they were cooking Brady Quinn on, on Twitter on Wednesday night. So the players are standing up and they, and and it's a fraternity. So the players are standing up for each other and it's good to see that. And for the Manning brothers, as far as I'm concerned, won't you get little brother in that camp? He's looking awful from what I'm hearing in Texas. Um, And all right, let's get to the Raiders. We've talked long enough. Um, I'll lay out these four scenarios on the path that the Raiders can take. They can trade up. They can trade down. They can make the seven pick and stay still right there, but also maybe trade some of those other 11 picks that they'll have to get back into the first round and get a quality offensive lineman, quarterback, linebacker, D-line, whatever. Or they make that seven pick, and that's that. 
I'm going to let you take it in any direction you think that the mo- that will be most likely that the Raiders take. Most likely scenario that the Raiders take, they, they stay at seven and they draft a, the top cornerback on the board. I hope is Devin Witherspoon. I said on Twitter earlier today, Thursday, that I'm going to carry an actual spoon with me on Thursday in my back pocket for good Raider draft buys because the Raiders need to break the streak of drafting underwhelming cornerbacks. Gary on Conley, Damon Arnett. Trayvon Mullen, they need to break the streak of whiffing on, on early round cornerbacks. And I think Devin Witherspoon could be the guy to do that. Now, if he's not available, because I think the Lions could actually take him at six after they traded Jeff Okuda to the Falcons, then you go with Christian Gonzalez. But if those two guys, or for some reason, neither of those two guys are on the board, then it gets interesting because then you would think that Tyree Wilson might be available. Jalen Carter, who's you know got some off the field issues this off season, might be available. Anthony Richardson might be available. I would be tempted to take Anthony Richardson. I know Raider fans don't want to hear about a quarterback Mm -hmm. because they're saying defense, defense, defense. But what I'm telling you is that I'm going to make a case for Anthony Richardson at seven right now simply because I think he would be worth the pick. If you're going to take a swing and you're not going to go defense and and you don't like the second cornerback on the board, I would go with Anthony Richardson because I always say this, that the quarterback position is the most important position. If you can find your guy for the next 10 to 15 years, you get that guy. Because let me tell you, J.J. Watt, one of the best defensive players in the league. How many playoff games did he win before Deshaun Watson got there? Aaron Donald was on a zero. Good, right. Aaron Donald was on a good Rams team. The Rams didn't win the Super Bowl until they got rid of Jared Goff and got Matthew Stafford and he had that magical year. So, the quarterback position is so important. Even if you hit on a top defensive guy, doesn't change your win-loss record at the end of the year. You need that quarterback. And Jimmy Garoppolo, to me, isn't it. You get Anthony Richardson. He started the year, seven touchdowns, seven interceptions in his first, I believe, eight games. Last four games, 10 touchdown passes, two interceptions. So the progression was there for him. I know a lot of people want to look at his stats, say he completed less than 55, 54% of his passes. The progression is there. He's trending upward. If you can get the Richardson and you don't like any defensive players on the board, get your quarterback. Well, I mean, and you also brought that up that, yeah, he's he's going to sit and be behind Jimmy G. Right. Jimmy G very rarely plays a full season, which means he'll get a little bit of experience this year. Mm-hmm. And also, if you believe what a lot of people say, that McDaniel's offense is extremely complicated, it'll be great that he'll be in a position to sit behind Jimmy G, someone who knows that offense and can kind of explain it um, outside of McDaniel's himself. So I'm with this 100%. I'm going to let you cook. Um, And this is the mandated question I have to ask, and I believe I now know the answer. With the Raiders, of course, being at seven, and you're hearing rumors, which honestly I don't believe, but it might happen. Bryce Young's probably going to go one, or C.J. Stroud. Is Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud the only two quarterbacks in this draft class that are worth trading up for if they want to move into that number three slot? and pick up a quarterback in the first round and just get it over with. I've said this for months now. At the beginning of this draft evaluation process, I said, if C.J. Stroud's available, you trade up for him. He's my quarterback one in this class. I think uh, Bryce Young is quarterback two. I do have concerns about the size. I look at Kyler Murray. He's been banged up at the end of the season. Is I worry about that. I know he, Bryce Young hasn't been hurt on a collegiate level, but it's different when you're banging against grown men in the NFL. So, I would be comfortable with getting C.J. Stroud at two or at three. So let's say the Texans are in love with C.J. Stroud and if Bryce Young goes one, I would make a call at two for C.J. Stroud. Forget the rumors that we're hearing about his Manning camp absenteeism or whatever you want to say. But I think, yes, to answer your question, Bryce Young is, is also worth trading up for. Even though I have concerns about the size, I think he's the prototypical modern-day quarterback. What I mean by that, the mobility that C.J. Stroud doesn't have you get that with Bryce Young. So even with his size, he's able to move the pocket so fluidly that you don't worry about him getting hit. If he was a statue back there at that size, I'm all out. But because he moves so well, even though I have the concerns, I think he could be a prototypical starter in this league. And again, in today's NFL world, you need a quarterback that can move. Not to say CJ Stroud can't because he showed he can do that against Georgia in, in the college football playoffs. But Bryce Young has him in that area. He's much better at movement in and out of the pocket so those two guys qb1 qb2 only two guys quarterbacks worth trading up for i'm not trading up for anthony richardson but if he's there at seven i definitely consider it okay and then let me do the flip side do you think it'll be worth it for the raiders to make a late round day two day three pick of quarterback 
um, in these later rounds in the draft. Clayton Toon has been my guy. Uh, I think he's going to be available in the fifth round. I think he's the type of player that, again, can move. He, so he has the athleticism. Doesn't have the strongest arm. I think he think he he has a Josh Allen arm. He doesn't have a Josh Allen arm, but he'll throw like it. He'll test defensive backs downfield. If you can rein him in on that and say, look, Clayton, you don't have a strong arm. Stick to the script. Stick to the midfield short passing throws. I think he's fine as a, oh. as a spot starter because, as we said, Jimmy Garoppolo is probably not going to play a full season, so you're going to have to stick a guy in there for maybe three, four games, maybe five, six games to steady the ship with Devontae Adams, with Jacoby Myers, with Hunter Renfro if they don't trade him, Austin Hooper coming in. So I think Clayton, too, could be that guy to be a spot starter because he has a lot of uh, playing experience. Uh, and, again, that with that athleticism and his accuracy, I think he's fine there. Aiden O'Connell out of Purdue is another guy playing in a pro-style offense. Doesn't have the athleticism as, as Clayton, too, has, but I think he could be another – Spot started in the fourth, fifth round again because he has that experience in the pro style offense, and coaches love that. All right, we'll go speed round on this because we're we're over time, but for rightfully so, we're, we're getting into it. Yeah. It's been a minute too. We haven't talked in a while. Um, over here, me at WrestleMania and all this nonsense. <laughs> so obviously, Raiders are in the top ten of the draft, which means this is a team that needs help in multiple areas. Uh, with within this roster, offensive line secondary linebackers defensive line so for you if i could kind of have you rank in terms of need what is most important to you i'm leaning secondary because you're in the division with patrick mahomes and justin herbert uh, but for you what is it what what is that um that that need position need or the the position that is that needs help the most i should say I have to go with linebacker because I don't think the Raiders have a single really? linebacker on the roster that's a starter. They signed Robert Spillane in free agency, but Robert Spillane to me is not a is not a, a locked starter. Mm -hmm. Divine Diablo didn't show much this past season. I know he had some bright moments as a rookie, but who is your starting linebacker? Remember, you you got you didn't re-sign Denzel Perriman. He's in Houston right now. So the Raiders are to me, they don't have one player on that roster where you could say that guy. Can is I push back really starter. quick? Go ahead, go Let ahead. me push back really quick. What if I'm like, this is just like basketball where the, the center position really doesn't matter anymore because it's it's just the sport is changing where you can put a safety out there, get more, get more safeties on the field. I need more athletes where those safety guys are typically, you know, like an Isaiah Simmons type player, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's flexible like that. What do you, what's the pushback on that? My pushback on that is, I, I, and I get your point because the game is getting faster. You're putting more athletes on the field. Safe, you're seeing more safeties playing in the box, less linebackers thumping. But I think if you're revamping a defense, I think the, the linebacker position is super important because that guy is the quarterback of your defense. A lot of times he's making the calls. He has the green dot. He's getting guys lined up. He has to make plays. Look at, what, look at how the Ravens defense changed once they got Roquan Smith. Ravens defense wasn't that good before he arrived. All of a sudden, Rogue, you stick Roquan Smith in there, it changes. Ravens defense got a lot stronger the day he got on that field. So I think if you're trying to overhaul a defense, that linebacker position is key. And if you don't have any starters there, and if you're going to have to rely on Darren Butler and Luke Masterson, no disrespect to those guys, but they're both undrafted free agents from last year. And Spillane, who can't cover, Divine Diablo, who said who was missing last year, who are you depending on in the middle of that defense? You're in a division with Travis Kelsey right now. So you have to you have to show up the middle of the field. And I think the Reds have to address the linebacker position. Now, if you're talking about value, value, yes, I agree. Cornerback, you have to address it. Value-wise, cornerback, top of the list. But as far as the, the position that needs the most help, it's got to be linebacker. You get Jack Campbell. You show up that position. Get a pure middle linebacker to at least give you a start. Give you somebody who's going to be a starter at that spot. Tight end is another one that I didn't mention that, of course, because of some things that have happened in this offseason, um, is going to be needed. Um, is there anyone or a couple of guys that you're looking at? Um, I'm assuming, I don't know why, I'm just penciling it in third round. I feel like they're going tight end. Um, how do you feel and, and who are you looking out for? Josh McDaniel's offense, very tight end friendly offense, as we know. Uh, in, in their last year together, Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler in New England, they signed two tight ends in free agency, John o. Smith and Hunter Henry. Now, John o. Smith is no longer there, but they spend on tight ends. So I think even though they signed Austin Hooper, they're going to, like you, I believe, third, fourth round, they'll go with a tight end. Tucker Craft is my guy out of South Dakota State. Sam Laporta, another guy out of Iowa. 
big part of that Iowa offense. That's that's tight end university right now. TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant, George Kittle, Raider fans remember Brandon Myers, who I believe was a sixth round pick in 2009. <laughs> These are Iowa guys, tight ends that came out of Iowa who had some flashes in the NFL or became pro bowlers or functional starters. So I think Sam Laporta, Tucker Craft, two guys I'm looking at. You know what's cool about working uh, for Odyssey and being a part of the Bet Las Vegas Mo is that I'm contractually not obligated to say some of the things that I need to say. Um, I totally forgot that the Raiders signed Austin Hooper this offseason because <laughs> Austin Hooper, Austin Hooper is ass. I can't wait. <laughs> for him to catch a wide open pass and then he immediately falls down for a gain of six. Second and four, baby, give it to Josh Jacobs. We'll get the first down and that's how we'll be rolling this season. So get ready for Austin Hooper to just randomly catch the ball and fall down. My man's kind of ass. Best of luck this season though, Austin. Uh, Um, Before we get you out of here, I want to know, you've been doing this a long time. We know where we can find you at. Um, I want to know, what is your worst prediction when it comes to a player? And then on the flip side, we'll give you some roses too. Who's the guy that you said was going to be good that turned out to be good? So I need your worst and best predictions when it comes to drafts. Wow, worst predictions. I would say recently I wasn't high on Jalen Hurts. I didn't think Jalen Hurts was going to be a starter in the NFL. I was one of the guys who criticized Jalen Hurts and said, I don't know, because you know, got replaced that got benched at Alabama. Uh, his his passing mechanics weren't great coming into the league. He went in the second round for a reason, obviously, but he worked his ass off. He worked hard, and now look at him now. He had a great performance in the Super Bowl, got a fresh new contract, highest paid player in the league right now. He's doing his thing, so he proved me wrong on that one. Please. Um, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did that come out on mute? I'm so sorry, guys. Dangerous game recording with your four-year-old son in the house. Keep going. My bad. <laughs> no, you're good. As far as a player that I hit on, I, I, I would say that I wasn't I wasn't as critical of Josh Allen as a lot of people. And I'll say, you know, it, and, I, and I compared it to Anthony Richardson. Josh Allen was another guy that came out under, I believe, 57 percent completion percentage. But he had the physical tools. And what I always say about quarterbacks in today's league is you bet on the tools. If a quarterback has the arm, has the ability to be a dynamic playmaker with his legs, you take a chance on that because you never know if, if he clicks, if he works, if he works hard at it, you, he already has a physical tools. He's already physically better than other players at the position. If he gets the basic stuff down pat, that guy could be special. And look at what the Bills are doing with him. They're, they're a playoff team. They're a Super Bowl contender. Cavs in five. Let's go <laughs> out of here. Mo, thank you as always. <laughs> Appreciate you, Adrian, even though you're wrong. <laughs>